My professional title is Licensed Professional Counselor um, in the state of Michigan. I am also a clinically certified trauma professional and a clinical supervisor for limited licensed professional counselors. I think the best way to describe the work that I do would be to say that I assist people through their problems. I provide space for people to kind of talk aloud and think aloud through things. Um, and the bulk of my job is honestly giving people permission to be themselves in a world where um, we are often meant to believe that something is wrong with us being different or being individuals when everyone is different, everyone is individuals, it can feel burdensome and that weighs heavy on people. And so the bulk of my work is releasing people from those false beliefs, from those negative schemas and allowing them the space to work out what it truly means to be themselves. What inspired me to work in the mental health field uh, is kind of two things. Um, the first one being, initially when I was an undergrad, I studied biology. Um, I wanted to become a doctor, so I was on a pre-med track. And I had never taken psychology classes in high school, because in my high school we picked majors, and my major in high school was business and marketing. Um, and I took psychology class, and it was fun. And so I took all of these psychology classes to kind of ease like the chemistry and the physics and <laughs> things like that. And I fell in love with psychology. Um, but it was just like a thing that I loved, just classes that I took for fun. And then when I became pregnant with my daughter in 2011, um, I started dealing with a lot of personal issues, a lot of mood issues, and things of that nature. And my doctor recommended me to go to therapy and it was just, it was such a beautiful experience. It was so healing. It was so freeing and it just, it really made a difference for me. So. Um, when it was time for me after I had my daughter, when it was time for me to decide, like buckle down on what I really wanted to do, I figured that why not do something that I love? Why not do something that I felt really helped people, really allowed me to connect to people and something that I truly believe in. So in mental therapy, we call it a, a, your therapeutic orientation. And my therapeutic orientation is that one, people don't get over things, they get things um, that techniques um, and tricks and little things that we have and that we can give are good for immediate solutions but they don't get to the root of healing so for me I think the most important thing is to have a space for someone to be able to listen to you a space where you are able to talk and a space where you are able to actually go to the source of things and find out where they come from, address them head on, and heal them so that you can move forward. There is not a lot of studies done or a lot of techniques developed based off of the Black experience, and it is disheartening. You know, I have saw different like assessments and things like that, that, you know, even down to if it's a personality assessment, um, do you turn red when this happens or that happens? Like just little, little stuff like that, that I don't think that people understand or even the idea of, I've saw people from different cultures where therapy says, because this is American culture and white culture, that this is wrong. So they need to be diagnosed with this when it's actually completely different. It's their cultural belief. Um, and so I think that for mental health to evolve overall and to be a better service to our community, we need more players. I think there needs to be more people from different cultures and from different spaces who are part of the mental health field. I think that there needs to be more studies done and conducted because everything is evidence-based, right? Therapy and mental health is all supposed to be evidence-based. I think this evidence gathering needs to happen in the communities that the techniques are supposed to serve. And not only that, but these studies need to be made by people who understand the culture in these places. So I definitely think that mental health overall needs to evolve um, from a space of just having more players and more people who actually have had some of these experiences and who understand these cultures better 
being the ones to address the needs of these cultures. You know, you look at these studies, you look at the populations that they use, you look at who's came up with and who's conducted these studies. How can you even assess the data that you have if you have a completely different scope and framework than the people who you are getting the observations from? I think as a community, a shift that needs to happen in order for us to um, have overall better mental health and overall better health and wealth in general is laying down ideals that don't fit us and don't naturally fit our culture. Um, these ideals that of strong, independent, as soon as you turn 18, you go out on your own and you do this and boom, 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 and you can't cry and you have to be tough and all of these things that some of it we've adopted because we've had to put them in place in order to survive, but really looking from a lens of no longer being in survival mode. Like we to have that time and space to take and give to ourselves. Like therapy is an hour a week typically for most people. You deserve an hour a week. And I think that there is part of our culture that makes us feel like we don't deserve things like that. Like that's white people stuff or you know, that's rich people stuff or that's this. And it's like, it's an hour a week, but it is your time that is dedicated to you. You are not watching your kids, you're not doing the dishes, you are not getting somebody's report ready, you are not doing any of those things. It is just, it's dedicated to you. And so I think that we really need to make that shift of just being okay with taking care of ourselves. It is not okay to take care of ourselves a lot of times in our culture. It is, you gotta hustle, you gotta grind, and you have to produce, 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 produce. What can you produce? What can you come up with? What can you get done? How much money can you make? How can you survive? And the only way to move out of survival mode is to make a decision. And so I would love to see us decide that we're important enough to live an abundant life, to live a happy life, to live a healthy life. I would like for us to be courageous enough to accept happiness. When you have been in survival mode, it becomes your comfort zone. And so it is radical and rebellious to step outside of your comfort zone and say, no, I'm going to be happy. I am going to thrive. I am going to live fully and live full out. It's scary. It's a scary place. And so I would love for us to have the courage to step out of what's comfortable and know that there's better for us on the other side. I think that an important piece of mental and emotional well-being is self-discovery and self-acceptance. I think in a world where we are super busy and there are tons of distractions, we are not given that opportunity so freely and we have to make and create that opportunity. I think that it's of the utmost importance, I think, to die or pass away and have never been your actual self, have never been who you wanted to be, have never been free to express the way that you want to express is the saddest thing ever. Because you were created and came here as you for a reason and we lose the freedom to be that, right? As we grow up um, and as parents, we're supposed to teach and guide our children in a way that we typically do that is what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what's okay, what's not okay, what fits and what works, and that's all based on our scope that we got from somebody else, that somebody got from somebody else, and we have these certain sets of rules and standards that we need in order to live cohesively and to survive. Uh, but a lot of times that goes beyond survival and it goes beyond cohesive living to it's not okay to be you or you need to consider what other people would think or feel, even if your actions literally don't hurt anyone, right? So what you wear doesn't hurt anyone else. What's your favorite color doesn't hurt anyone else. So no, you don't need to consider anyone else when it comes to expressing yourself if it is not hurting other people. Um, but it takes time to find out what that is because we've spent so many years in adolescence getting that taken away from us or being told, being told to tone it down. 
And so I think that when it comes to being mentally and emotionally well, which also needs to be physically well and being well overall, it is it needs to be our number one priority to find out who we are, okay ourselves to be who we are, and to show up as us every opportunity that we get. I would like to be remembered as being genuinely happy. Um, not for what I was able to produce, not for what I was able to give anybody who knows me or who feels who knows that I give to no end. Um, not for how intelligent I am or anything. Like if I had to pick something, it'd be happiness because I know I talked about it earlier in the interview, but choosing to be happy is so, is so radical in itself. It is so freeing and we are so deserving of it. Um, so just being and that being enough, like if I am known for being happy without having to do X, Y, and Z and without having to give X, Y, and Z, I would hope that it would help someone realize like she was happy just by being. It wasn't something that she earned. It wasn't that someone else had to give her, which means it's not something that I have to earn. It's not something that I have to have permission for. It's not something that someone else has to give me. My very birth, my very livelihood gives me the right for happiness. And I can find that right wherever I am. If I am happiness, that is wherever I am.